What's going on ladies and gents, boys and girls, guardians of all ages, Joker back again, once again. So, there's a comic book artist by the name of, and I'm probably going to say this wrong, Jay Lee, whose art I've been studying as of late. Like Master Raul says, the best cryptarchs are not known by their name, but by their work. Which is what I knew Jay Lee for for the longest time before I was able to track down his name. And as I think about it now, that's probably why each and every one of us know Master Raul by name. Hmm. Jokes aside, I want to incorporate aspects of Lee's art into my own. There's this otherworldly dreamlike realism to every image that I see of his. It's kind of like something that you remember at the edge of the dreaming, but at any moment it can be blown away like smoke. One of the comic books that Lee worked on was an adaptation of Stephen King's The Dark Tower, a simply haunting and beautiful adaptation of the series. When the 9 minute Vidoc for Destiny 2's Forsaken Expansion ended, I couldn't help but get this Jay Lee The Dark Tower meets Mad Max meets Lord of the Rings vibe. And it was this juxtaposition of design and ideas that instantly had me intrigued. During this Vidoc, Destiny started to look like Destiny again, both in beauty and grotesqueness. This DLC looks haunting and alive, beautiful and mysterious. The Destiny displayed in this Vidoc was, perhaps for the first time in Destiny 2's life cycle, something that felt truly inspired and inspiring. One might even say it looked like a labor of love. The Vidoc did everything that it needed to do. It told us that changes were coming. It even provided in the limited time frame that it had demonstrations of some of these changes. The new Gambit mode looks like it will be an absolute blast to play. And again, I mean that. No sarcasm here. Legitimately, this looks like it will be a blast to play. For those of you who don't know what Gambit is, Gambit is this kind of horde mode with a twist. First, it's not Escalation Protocol. There's none of this BS where you go to a destination and you hope that the matchmaking gods are smiling down upon you and you and your friends get matched together and you load into a zone so you don't have to load into a zone after a zone after a zone after a zone, hoping that you can get nine people together just to try to get a shotgun. Nope, none of that. Gambit has its own matchmaking hopper. It's going to be on the directory. You click it, you load into it, you play it. But wait, there's more. Not only is it a horde mode, but like I said, it's a horde mode with a twist. You will be competing against an enemy team of four to score the most motes before the match ends. But wait, there's even more. Both teams are in their own separate instances. However, every once in a while you can open a portal and send one member of your team through to the other side. Now, this isn't some straight up Adele hello from the other side bullshit. See, instead of wishing you tried, you're gonna come through with a rocket launcher and rock the enemy team's world, or a super, or whatever you had. I, I really hope that you people actually go through with a plan, because that'll make this joke look really stupid in hindsight. I'm, I'm depending on you. Don't, don't let me down. Anyways, uh, moving forward, this mode just looks like a lot of fun. It looks like one of those things that I could easily see myself getting drunk and streaming with you guys. And the Vidoc shows us a handful of the new supers, and we learn that there's like, nine kind of retweaks to the subclasses that holy shit the only thing they didn't do was show us if there's new perk trees or if there's still just talent grids which i really wish they would have shown us and i would be an absolute liar if i didn't say at first glance there's a lot of good here a lot to be excited about a mountain of wins and then some we got random rolls back we got weapon slot changes we got huge quality of life improvements, like triumphs, collectibles, things that'll free up your vault space from shaders and sparrows and ships and all the other junk you've been collecting because you bought it from Eververse or you got it out of an engram and you had no place to put it, but then your vault was getting kind of clogged with items as well and you're like, well, this is how I live now, on top of getting more vault space. And now, instead of going back to the tower to access these collections, you can just access them through a menu. There's what looks like it could be the return of the fucking Grimoire. Are you fucking kidding me? It, it, in the form of an in-game codex? Are you- what? This is fucking amazing. And while now is definitely not the time to stop critiquing Bungie by any means, because we would not have these changes if we didn't critique them, 
Destiny 2 Forsaken, at first glance, looks like it is finally bringing the destiny we deserve to the table. I can say, without a doubt, that by the end of the Vidoc, for the first time in a long time, I was legitimately excited to see something coming out of Destiny. I mean that. It's a shame, ladies and gents, boys and girls, guardians of all ages, that Bungie didn't leave well enough alone. Oh, no, 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 no. Can't have that. Oh, shit. See, they should have just let the Vidoc do the talking for them, and then waited till E3 to do or say anything else. But no, no. They didn't. See, they followed the Vidoc, this Vidoc that I have a glowing review about, with one of the most unhelpful and downright frustrating to watch live streams I think I have ever seen come out of Bungie. Fuck, fuck, shut up, shut up! These live streams have always had an air of last second preparation to them. It's part of their charm. Some tend to have more to say than others but they always feel more PR than community outreach. The community manager, Deej, who I'm sure does a tremendous amount of work behind the scenes, and I am grateful for that, has made a habit of masterfully stumbling through these streams and interviews doing nothing but spouting PR doublespeak. Watching Deej interview or do a live stream is, again, just one of the most frustrating things in the world to watch, because he says a lot of stuff, but explains oh so very little. This PR hype has led to some of the most amusing gaffes, like two tokens and a blue. But at the end of the day, it causes more harm than good. It causes way more confusion than clarity. I for one believe in letting the content speak for itself, instead of letting Bungie try and fail poorly to explain it to us. In fact, it has been this inability to actually describe in words the scope and scale and nature of their content that has gotten them into trouble time after time. It's easy to sell something when the quality is apparent. The product sells itself. It's hard to put a PR spin on a piece of shit. And that is the tale of two stories we have today, ladies and gents, boys and girls, guardians of all ages. Something where the quality appears to be self-evident and a piece of shit. While the livestream showed us the return of random rolls, armor perks, and weapon slot changes, it failed to expand on any of these changes with any real depth or gravity. And that's where the trouble starts. After all, Destiny 2 looked really great. And then Bungie started talking about Destiny 2. That's when the trouble started and there seems to be some rather large cracks with this DLC as well. Let me give you some examples, and maybe, just maybe, it'll help you to understand why I felt that the livestream failed, and perhaps outline what I'm looking forward to seeing in the coming weeks from E3 to GuardianCon. The return of random rolls should be something that we're all celebrating, or at least something that I'm celebrating, but I'm sitting here waiting for the other shoe to drop. As I've stated before here and on the Destiny Tracker podcast, if they just give us random rolls with just the handful of lackluster perks that already exist in Destiny 2, then the exercise is ultimately pointless. The weapon slot changes can be viewed in very much the same light. I mean, we got them. And not only did we get them, but we got them and more. Now you can wield three shotguns. Why not three shotguns, right? Just for the fun of it. This should be delightful news. Again, another hard-fought and categorically won battle. Yet, there are so many things we don't know about the new weapon economy. Like, what's a primary shotgun's power in relation to a secondary shotgun's power in relation to a heavy shotgun's power? What does the ammo economy look like for that? How's that going to be balanced in PvP? If somebody's running around with three Felwinner's Lies, we're going to have problems. Don't get me wrong, I'm all for PvP being an unbalanced mess. I just, when I want to play Gears of War, I'll play Gears of War. There's things we don't know, like, how do armor perks work? Did they just roll mods onto armor and call it a day? Will armor affect power cooldowns like they did in Destiny 1? Will there be a tier 12 armor grind or not? 
The reason it's important for us to know about this as soon as possible is because it allows us more time to give feedback on what we've seen, and it allows Bungie more time to act on that feedback. For example, random rules may be back in Destiny 2, but the weapon perks are just the current Destiny 2 trash weapon perks. If we know about this in advance, we can say, hey Bungie, it's really great that you are bringing back random rules, but you really need to add more perks to the perk pool before you ship in September. Same thing with weapon slots. It's like, hey, yeah, you know what? It's really cool that I can have a primary shotgun, but um, maybe not have all three shotguns the equivalent of Fell Winter's Lie. Just, just some food for thought. And of course, I can't help but wonder how much of this will actually be available to players without the DLC. Let me explain. Well, the updates to the sandbox and the player interface will be available theoretically to all players because these are core systems that are being changed and will affect all players, there is a real possibility that, although everybody can in the most technical sense equip a primary shotgun as this is how features and systems work together, it turns out that the only primary shotguns available are tied to the Forsaken DLC, as Historically speaking, new weapons and armor have always been tied to the DLC. And unfortunately, it's not like this would be the first, second, third, fourth, or even fifth time that Bungie has locked off content to players in order to incentivize the purchasing of DLC. We have yet to be shown how these changes will be made retroactively, and it's odd because this would have been a very easy change to demonstrate just have 10 better devils with different roles, or a better bone structure in the primary or secondary slot. And to be absolutely clear, we're talking about the failings of the live stream and what we still need to see. So I'm not saying that these changes haven't been made. What I am saying is they had the venue in which to demonstrate in no uncertain terms and remove any and all doubt, and they didn't. Which, inevitably, brings us to why this live stream truly failed. Perhaps I wouldn't be so hung up about these issues if Bungie didn't have a proven track record of somehow, some way, whenever they implement any change whatsoever, completely and utterly missing the point. And two, if they didn't spend the time that they could have used to elaborate on these changes, to try and upsell us on a season pass like a second-rate GameStop clerk. And let's not mince any words here. This is not a season pass in the vein of something like what we had with Destiny 1 and Destiny 2, with Dark Below and House of Wolves and Curse of Osiris and Warmind. No. There's no story content with the annual pass. Once the Destiny campaign is finished, uh, a lot of players are always asking us, what's now? What's next? How are you going to keep me engaged over the course of a year? Give me a roadmap for all of the other moments when I know that my hobby as a guardian is going to be infused with new things to do. Uh, one of our new answers to that question is something that we're calling the annual pass. Uh, this is a new way for us to sustain the game with new releases of content. Uh, and if we can keep the main graphic on the screen for just one moment longer, uh, I want to call out the fact that the annual pass uh, has three different releases. Uh, this is live on destinythegame.com right now, uh, and because our product pages have gone live, we just want to set some expectations for how this is different from what you may have known this year. Uh, if you played Curse of Osiris, if you played Warmind, this is a different thing. So if you're the type of person that you know, throws your money down on something as soon as it becomes available, we'd like to set your expectations that this is different than those expansions. What we have here are three different releases that will come out over the course of the year. Uh, Black Armory, Joker's Wild, and Penumbra uh, in the winter, spring, and summer to come. So these releases are a new way for us to deliver content. Uh, what would you say, what purpose would you say that these serve? Uh, I think that the, the, the purpose here is to give you more of what you want more often. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, it's also about, it's more about, the, uh, chase, it's more about chasing the power and the gear. Okay. Um, and 
basically that's yeah that's yeah. it i mean it's yeah. more, more often a more stuff that you huge care about. cornerstone for destiny the acquisition of power yeah. the collection of new gear the upgrading of your character that's really what people talk about when they refer to the destiny hobby yep uh let me take a deeper dive into exactly what you'll find in these different releases uh over the course of the year in the annual pass and if we can give people uh, a read on this uh here is what across these three different releases you can find in your annual pass. Uh, end game challenges, obviously new things to collect, uh, new and returning exotics, uh, new pinnacle activities, you know, deeply challenging things to really test your, your skill and your teamwork, uh, new triumph records to collect, and we'll take a, a look at exactly how that'll unfold in the game, and new lore to discover and collect in the game yeah. using new tools and features that we'll be delivering to uh, every player. Uh, the annual pass does have exclusive content for the people that purchase it, uh, but this collection game is about to evolve in year two. So, if I'm not misunderstanding what was just stated in that video, what was stated on Reddit, and what's been talked about on Twitter, then the content that makes up this pass is the very same content that we received in Destiny 1 via the April updates. You know, the content that the cash shop was originally created to fund. And now, not only are we being asked to fund that content via the cash shop, but through this annual pass? Let that sink in for a moment. Good? You got it? Is it sunk in? Did you, did you think about that? I have no issue paying $40 for Forsaken. I don't. The expansion looks like it'll be a hell of a lot of fun. And it also looks like it's the culmination of a year's worth of trying to get Bungie to not only listen, but actually fucking do something. I am super excited for Forsaken. It looks great. And at first blush, it does look like a product that I have no qualms with throwing $40 at. But there always seems to be something seedy about Bungie's business practices that seem to focus on taking as much money from the player base as possible. And this isn't just Activision's influence, as Bungie has another IP in the works, independent from Activision, that is destined for the Chinese market, a market notorious for games that are pay to win and chocked full of microtransactions, pretty much because piracy is such a huge thing there. I mean, hey, don't get me wrong, like, a huge portion of the planet's population lives there. You should probably try to break into that market, it's good business, but... Let's not pretend that Bungie doesn't know what they're doing anymore, please, ladies and gents, boys and girls, guardians of all ages, it's just a tiring argument. Even if we go ahead and step away from the season pass for two seconds. The fact that Forsaken will require players to buy all of Destiny 2's DLC to play Forsaken is scummy. More so after Warmind didn't require the ownership of Curse of Osiris to play Warmind. I guess Bungie plans on getting their pound of flesh for the DLC one way or another. And I think it's been fairly well documented on this channel that uh, Curse of Osiris and Warmind were, well, horrible abominations of DLC. And holding what Destiny 2 should have been, at least on paper, ransom behind some arbitrary paywall outside of the cost of the new DLC is absurd. Somebody who bought Destiny 2 and tapped out before the Curse of Osiris and Warmind, who has seen Destiny 2 Forsaken and they're hearing good things about it, and they want to give Forsaken a shot, like, oh, I don't know, the vast majority of people who played Destiny 1 and played Destiny 2, but bailed before the Curse of Osiris, shouldn't be required to own the bad DLC to play Forsaken. I'm sorry. That's just absurd. And yes, for the record, it was absurd when Bungie did it with House of Wolves and Dark Below for the Taken King. It's just greedy, and it pushes away the majority of the Destiny 2 player base that didn't buy the Destiny 2 DLC, and left before Curse of Osiris, and have been waiting for the game to be fixed. Like, I don't know, a actually solid majority of my audience. Why should anyone have to spend $40 on an outdated DLC and then $40 for Forsaken? That's $80 just to get in the door. And there stands Bungie at the door with their handout asking for another $35 to $40 up front for the annual pass. So what are we at now? 
120? Again, that's just scummy. Why would anyone in their right mind pay 80 to $120 for this game when games like Spider-Man, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Call of Duty Black Ops 4, Battlefield 5, Red Dead Redemption 2, and games like, I don't know, possibly Darksiders 3, Metro Exodus, the new Soul Calibur, the new Pokemon, the new Smash, or the new, if I'm being absurdly ambitious, Halo or Borderlands or Anthem. Point being, the end of the year has way more games for 60 bucks than what Destiny 2 is asking for 80 or 120. God, the end of the year is going to be hell when I actually start reviewing other games. It's just scummy, it's just greedy, it's just Bungie's anti-consumer business model as usual. Not to make Bioware or EA sound any better than they actually are, but Bioware and EA get a lot of shit, and rightfully so, for their anti-consumer practices. At least with those games, I could pick and choose the DLCs I wanted to play with Dragon Age and Mass Effect. I'm just saying. And I already know what the inevitable argument that somebody is typing out in the comments below will be. But Joker! Destiny is a holistic game. If you go to Mercury or Mars in the course of the DLC, like we've done with every DLC since DLCs happened in Destiny, because honestly, do you really think Bungie is going to pass on a chance to reuse old content? Then people who don't have the DLC will not be able to play that content. To which... I say, that's a load of shit. Do you honestly expect me to believe that Bungie is incapable of locking off the Curse of Osiris quests, items, and endgame content, and just allowing the playable space that is Mercury to be utilized for the Forsaken DLC? Nor is there any reason they can't do the exact same thing for Mars? Do you really expect me to believe that Bungie is incapable of doing that? Well, I guess from a business sense, they are incapable of doing that because if they were, air quote, capable of doing that, then you wouldn't be forced to buy shitty DLC to play the content that you actually want to play. And if we come back to the annual pass for everything that Bungie has outlined thus far, we are paying for stuff that Eververse was supposed to pay for. Except now, that stuff isn't free, and Eververse is still going to remain in the game. Huh. Funny how that works. In fact, I'm kind of getting Taken King flashbacks to pricing. If only, if only there was a song. It's all about the money, money, money. You just want my money, money, money. I'm sorry, Mr. Luke Smith. You guys are taking the piss. It's not about the... The Taken King, it's more about this heh, whole pricing thing. Man, it still was in the bag until you mentioned your price tag. Ah, uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. I started this video talking about all the things that I wished Bungie had shown us during the reveal for the Forsaken. Because at the end of the day, I genuinely want to see the Forsaken succeed where Destiny 2 failed. And throughout this 23 and a half minute stream of consciousness rant, I guess at the end of it, I've come to appreciate the fact that Bungie couldn't stop themselves from going full Bungie because there is time to talk about it and time to act and time to correct this course. Because there are clearly some very anti-consumer practices going on with Forsaken. What looks to be arguably the best piece of content Destiny has had since Taken King and could ultimately accomplish even more than Taken King did. For the Destiny franchise, pushing Destiny back to where it needs to be. Even if we were just to be pragmatic, Bungie needs to do something about the year one DLC requirement, as this cuts the player base and instantly puts people off, further diluting the player pool. And second, they need to reevaluate the content of the year two season pass, because as explained as of now, as I understand it now at least, this is nothing more than three separate April updates for 35 to 40 bucks. Essentially what Bungie is trying to do is charge an annual subscription without calling it an annual subscription. Because if Destiny 2 Year 1 is any indication of what Bungie means by new armor and new weapons, then the season pass is already wanting. You know, this video was really depressing for me to make. I truly wish that the only complaint I could muster was 
while it's great to see that they have changes, I really wish they would have explained the changes with more detail. But no, no, once again, here we are with another money pricing DLC debacle. I know that one way or another, over the course of the next couple of weeks and months, we'll find out the answers to all those questions I had about the sandbox changes to Forsaken. But at the end of the day, when all is said and done, Forsaken is going to be this game that looks like it is going to be amazing, but it will ultimately be overshadowed by Bungie's anti-consumer business practices. And to be absolutely, positively clear, I'm not saying that the season pass should be free, nor am I saying that Forsaken should be free. What I am saying is that Bungie should reevaluate the amount of content or the quality of content that is going into the season pass based on what they have shared with us as of now. What I am saying is Bungie should reevaluate the business practice of forcing people to buy really shit DLC in order to play the content that they want. If people own Destiny 2 and they're willing to pay the $40 to play Forsaken, then they should be able to play Forsaken. I, I don't get why this is so hard. I don't understand why there's so many steps in between this. I don't understand why there's an arbitrary price tag between point A and point B of two already accepted price tags. I just... It's stupid, man. It's stupid. But hey, those are just my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. And like always... Stay frosty.